Thanks, Amy. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, we broke, before we took our break, we're going to continue today with uh, more information about kind of the security of elections. And one thing that is different that I don't think we've actually kind of realized until 2020, or at least it wasn't wasn't a topic that we probably would have brought up was addressing physical threats to elections and election officials. So this is definitely a, a new uh, area for us to be covering. Um, sad that we have to, but here we are. Um, so today we're happy to have in front of us the um, some great panelists. We have John Keller, who's the Principal Deputy Chief of the Public Integrity Section of the U.S. Department of Justice. We have Sean Mulryan, Deputy Director, Elections Crimes Branch, Criminal Division, Public Integrity Section, U.S. Department of Justice, and Kirk Spielmaker, Supervisory Special Agent, Public Corruption Unit, Federal Bureau of Investigation. So we really appreciate you guys taking the time to come talk to us today um, about addressing physical threats to election and election officials. Thanks, Michelle. Amy, uh, I'll go ahead and launch if if that's good. All right. Yep. Uh, so th this task force was formed to investigate, prosecute, and deter threats to election workers, election officials. Uh, we recognize that over the last year, there have been far more threats leveled at you and your colleagues uh, than DOJ was aware of, at least nationally, uh, and FBI, uh, I think similarly, was unaware of, of Kind of the scope of threats and the and the increase in volume of threats over the last election cycle, at least on a uh, from a national perspective. And so, we've we've formed this task force to work jointly with local FBI offices in every state and local United States Attorney's offices in every state, along with state and local law enforcement partners, to try and ensure that there is increased visibility at the headquarters level, at the national level on all threats to election officials. And part of the problem that I think we've identified is that in the past, if there was a threat to an election worker or an election official and it was reported, often the, the first report, which uh, which is, is the right thing to do, went to a state or local law enforcement agency to try and address any any imminent threat to life. And that's that's how things should work. State and locals are best positioned to respond quickly and to uh, try and address any potential threats. Uh, but what that meant was that our state and local uh, counterparts were often assessing a threat uh, right up front in real time, and then we're moving on to the next thing because, of course, uh, they're very busy agencies, uh, oftentimes overloaded and don't have the resources and the capacity to kind of step back and do a more uh, thorough uh, uh, kind of lengthy historical investigation. And so uh, what we're trying to do is ensure that FBI now is essentially the front line, the first line in terms of receiving reports of threats. It, of course, if anyone is is in imminent danger or feels an acute threat, the first call should be 911. But if it is if, if it's more of a, a pervasive pattern of harassment or a threat that, while concerning, doesn't give rise to the level of, of immediate danger, it should be reported to the FBI. And even threats that do give rise to, to a concern of immediate danger after that call to 911 uh, and after the danger is addressed by the locals, uh, it should also be reported to the FBI. So we have we have worked with all of the election crime coordinators, which is a title I know many of you are familiar with. Uh, and election crime coordinators sit in every field office across the country. There are, I believe, 56 FBI field offices, one in at least one in every state. So there's at least one election crime coordinator in every state. And we've provided that information to Amy to, to distribute to you guys. Uh, but if you learn of an election threat, our hope is that you will report it to your election crime coordinator locally. And then what we've done is FBI has implemented a system such that any report to an election crime coordinator or any report to one of the national uh, reporting hotlines 
or a report submitted uh, submitted online, and we'll give you the information to file those reports if you don't already have it uh, here shortly. Those are tagged and immediately elevated to the public corruption unit at National FBI headquarters here in DC, and uh, and then also routed to us here at DOJ. So what we've tried to do is remove all of the levels of middlemen um, for the for the purpose of reporting to enhance visibility and increase our ability to actually investigate and uh, potentially prosecute, but at a minimum, assess and address these threats on an individual basis. Who, who is part of the task force and what practical difference does, does a task force have versus, um, you know, Historically, just reporting something to your to your local sheriff's office, or your local police department, or your local um, you know state attorney general's office. Well, the public integrity section, where where both Sean and I work, is a a specialized unit within DOJ that functions much much like a United States attorney's office. So, for those of you that are familiar with that, those are the federal prosecutors in each in each state in the country. There there's a U.S. attorney's office in every major city. And many states have multiple districts, so there are multiple United States Attorney's Office uh, within the state. But uh, they are generally responsible for prosecuting all of the federal crimes that occur in their district or in their state. Public integrity section is responsible not for a specific geographic area, but for a subject matter area. So we have nationwide jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute uh, offenses across the country but we focus only on public corruption and election crimes. So the public corruption piece is bribery and extortion by, by public officials. The election crime piece is voter intimidation, vote buying, uh, false or fraudulent voter registrations, campaign finance offenses, and of course, uh, threats to election infrastructure or election workers. So uh, where historically you might have a report to a United States attorney's office that did not have very much subject expertise in, in the election crime space or, or uh, even more so a local police department or uh, a sheriff's office that didn't have much experience in that area. By virtue of the task force now, our section, the public integrity section and public corruption investigators, election crime investigators with the FBI are made aware of and are involved in all of the assessments and investigations and prosecutions of uh, threats to election workers going forward. So what we hope is that what this is going, the, the practical effect of the task force is going to be that uh, we are able to, because we have oftentimes greater resources um, to devote to these, these kind of specialized areas, that we're gonna be able to more promptly and more thoroughly in, investigate and address uh, instances of election threats. Um, and that, what, what does that look like? Um, well, it, it, it should look like, and I think based on a few examples, we've already seen it working out this way. It, it should look like if you as an election worker uh, are threatened and you file a report with your election crime coordinator or you, or you make a report online to FBI, that is immediately tagged the public corruption unit at FBI uh, brings it to PIN's attention. We then reach out to the local U.S. Attorney's Office and the local FBI office so that we're ensuring that there is outreach to you as the victim to get more information about the about the threat. If you if you know who made the threat, uh, if there were additional threats that were made, if there's been additional harassment of which uh, we should be aware, if there are additional facts that are relevant, such as you know, something leading up to the threat or, or um, exactly how the threat was made or whether you have a screenshot uh, or, or a record of the, of the actual communication that was sent. Uh, and then we will investigate to try and uh, determine attribution, figure out who is actually responsible for making the threat. And if we're able to do that, uh, perhaps make contact with that individual on a, on a case by case basis uh, to Again, investigate whether there was criminal intent there, but also B, uh, discourage and deter this kind of threatening message, uh, threatening messaging and, and deter it from, uh, from 
the federal uh, federal law enforcement perspective. So that's that's what it should look like. Now, if there if there are threats that you do not report as an individual official or your colleagues don't report, but of which we or the FBI become aware of because someone else forwards some social media post that threatens a certain individual in a certain state, even if it wasn't directed to your email address or, or a phone call directly to you, the, the process is essentially the same. Uh, FBI will intake it, flag it, it'll, it'll, be, uh, it'll be elevated to headquarters. Headquarters will uh, coordinate with us, the, the prosecutors, and again, we'll reach out to the local election crime coordinator and make them aware of the fact that someone is threatening an official in their district and have the election crime coordinator reach out, contact you, inform you of the, of the threat if you weren't already aware of it, and again, try and obtain more information so that, uh, so that it can assist our, our criminal investigation. Uh, not all of these threats are going to be actionable. Federally, we only have jurisdiction for certain kinds of communications that are sent to election workers. So uh, there, there are several statutes that are available to us, but they all have different jurisdictional requirements that, that would allow us to prosecute them federally. So one of them requires that a threat of bodily injury be sent by means of an interstate uh, by means of interstate communications. So it could be cell phones, it could be over the internet, it could be social media posting, but uh, a threat of, of bodily injury. But of course, that statute wouldn't allow us to prosecute a threat made in person or uh, or a purely intrastate threat. Uh, then there there's another statute that allows us to prosecute federally. Uh, a course of conduct of harassment uh, carried out over over uh, interstate facilities of, of interstate commerce. So again, uh, basically over the internet, use of a computer, uh, a course of conduct means two or more instances of threats or harassment. You know that that would allow us to potentially prosecute federally. Uh, there's a there's another telephone specific statute. It allows us to prosecute federally if someone calls you, does not identify themselves, and uh, engages in threatening or intimidating uh, behavior. But they're all slightly different. Each statute has a slightly different requirement uh, to allow us to, to prosecute federally. And so, you know, many of these cases may not meet certain federal criteria. Uh, there's also the issue of what really constitutes a threat. So. Most importantly, we want we want you to leave this presentation with the understanding that we want you to be over inclusive in what in what you report. If you are concerned by a communication that you receive, we want you to report it. Um, whether it's harassment, whether it's just offensive, or whether it actually threatens bodily injury or harm to you or your family members. But that said, we, we want we want to know about it for the purpose of visibility and to and so that we can investigate and see if maybe there's more than just the one explicit threat that was or one explicit communication that was made and, and potentially deter the actors there. But that doesn't mean we're gonna be able to prosecute it. Um, so we want you to be over inclusive in terms of what you report. Again, if you are concerned, if you are uncomfortable, if certainly if if you feel unsafe, uh, we want you to report it. But the only things that we can likely prosecute federally uh, are going to be threats of direct threats to injure you or a family member um, and not things that are more in the lane of political hyperbole. So, you know, just a few examples of, of real, real world cases that we've seen recently, things like uh, you know, you are a Bolshevik and you should be prosecuted. We, we, if, if there is a kind of pattern of harassment there, or if, if a communication like that uh, concerns you, we would like you to report it. We would like to know about it, but we are unlikely to be able to prosecute that as a threat, uh, as, as pointed and, and as uh, critical and as offensive as it may be, that's likely to fall more into the lane of political hyperbole and the reason why we can't prosecute that as a threat is a 
it doesn't really convey a, a threat to injure in explicit terms. And B, the, the way it's phrased it makes it sound like it's more in the lane of, of political speech. Uh, you know, another example, you sh threats of prosecution, you should be, you should be prosecuted, you're a communist, you know, not, not something we could probably prosecute. The true patriots will rise and you will be annihilated, kind of general language like that, where there's reference to revolution, probably not something that we're going to be able to prosecute as a threat. There's also been a lot of references recently, and maybe it's because people are savvy enough to be aware of, of this uh, of, of this First Amendment line, or maybe it's just because it's a it's it's a popular um, way to express criticism. But there have been a, we've seen a lot of references to the offense of treason and accusations to election officials of being guilty of treason, and that the punishment for treason is hanging. Um, you know, you should be you should be hanged uh, for treason. Again, that's more likely to fall into the realm of political speech. Um, on the other side, we've seen very explicit threats, things like we will uh, we will murder you and your family. Uh, your, you know, threats to to people's family members and children specifically. And I don't I don't raise these things to to scare you. I just I, I want you to have these examples, and and most of you are probably already aware of them anyway. But you know, things like your daughter is beautiful. Um, I. I I hope that nothing happens to her on the way to school. You know, things like that uh, are are clearly ex, um, threats to to injure you or your family member. Those are things that are more readily actionable for us federally. So, um, to the extent that you're curious about the distinctions and where the lines are, maybe those examples give you some idea. But again, we want you to report all of it. Um, if you're being, if you're receiving threatening or harassing or offensive communications, uh, at this point, we would, we would like to just be aware of all of it so that, um, so that we can make sure it's, it's being addressed, um, appropriately. So in terms of reporting, Amy, it doesn't look like I am able to share content. Can you give me the ability to share? Oh, yep. Yes, I will do that right now. You should have the power now. I've got it. Thank you. Let's see if I can. So it's a little difficult for me to tell, but I think you should see a, a just one slide uh, titled Task Force on Threats to Election Workers. Um, yep. Okay, great. So the election crime coordinator, again, should be your first point of contact after, again, if it's an imminent threat, after you report to state or local law enforcement or call 911. But then uh, hopefully your first point of contact is your election crime coordinator. If for some reason you don't want to uh, call the election crime coordinator, you can manually report the information. You can, uh, you can write a report on the website that's listed there, tips.fbi.gov. And uh, that will be routed again to headquarters, the public corruption unit of FBI, and will be shared with us at the public integrity section and the task force and allow us to respond promptly. There's also an, an 800 number, which is FBI's general uh, tip line. You'll see references to a couple of prompts there. So I have called this line. I, I will tell you, I would encourage anyone who wants to report these threats to call the election crime coordinators directly or to report it on the on the website, the the um, the 800 number and the prompts are just a little bit of a little bit cumbersome, and there um, there's a fair amount of boilerplate pre-recorded language that you have to go through before you actually speak to to an individual. But it, it's also there as another option if you would prefer to do it if you prefer to report it that way. It, if if for some reason it's something uh, that you feel like is extremely urgent. Um, not necessarily in the life threatening sense, but just something that you think warrants uh, even more immediate attention. I would say report it to Amy. She has Sean and my contact information and can pass it along to us directly. But that that kind of um, routes around the normal intake process, and so then we'll have to um, we'll have to then report it to FBI. And FBI will then have to create um, an intake 
And so uh, it's it, it will work, I think, most efficiently if the if the first line of reporting goes to an FBI office and, and especially an election crime coordinator. But again, if you want to also share it with Amy, or certainly if you don't, if you don't get a response, if you've heard nothing from an election crime coordinator or anyone from the FBI after uh, a couple of weeks after you've you've reported this information, then please do let Amy know so that uh, she can bring it to Sean and my attention, and we can talk with the FBI and figure out if. Uh, you know what what the reason is what's going on in the background uh what what might be the reason for the delay but we want to ensure that these uh, issues are addressed as as quickly as possible so um that's really all the information that i wanted to convey uh, sean and kirk i know you're both on the line if there are things i missed or things that you wanted to add before we open it up to questions can anyone hear me I can, Sean. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is this is Sean Mulryan, John's uh, colleague at the Public Integrity Section. Uh, first of all, again, thank you all very much for inviting us. It's an honor and a privilege to be joining you this afternoon. Um, just to uh, elaborate on just a couple quick points from John. One, uh, as John has said multiple times, if you're in imminent, uh, immediate danger, do call 911. Call your local law enforcement officials, because as John said, they'll be the ones who are most able to uh, respond quickly and, and hopefully diffuse what could be a physically threatening or otherwise threatening situation. Um, I just wanted to further point out, because I know this has come up in some discussions with state and local election um, uh, authorities and officials, is that if you are working in an active polling site, and if there are threats that are being, um, being uh, thrust upon you at that polling site, um, particularly in person, uh, the FBI, federal law enforcement authorities are somewhat inhibited by being able to respond to an active polling site. And so in those cases as well, state and local law enforcement will be your best um, immediate response team. But please don't take any of those advisements as a discouragement from reaching out to us. And here again, I'm echoing John and, and the entire purpose of this task force, which is that the department and the bureau recognize that the prevalence, the proliferation of threats against election workers is, is an issue of increasing concern. And so you should always feel free to reach out to, to the FBI and to reach out to the department through all the ways and means that John has highlighted here. And as you heard, we will be responsive affirmatively and proactively. Um, and to this, uh, one final point, by virtue of the fact that we're speaking to all of you, obviously uh, you're, you're hopefully aware that the task force is here to help all of you. But I do know that in some discussions, again, with state and local election officials, there sometimes is a question as to, well, you know, who is there to help different election workers? In other words, if I'm a volunteer um, in an election, as opposed to an elected official, like a secretary of state, if I'm a career public servant who works in elections, as opposed to um, someone who is a contractor or a vendor who is hired, contracted to assist with election administration, you know, if, if any of those people uh, are threatened, who should be contacting this task force? Who should be contacting the department and the bureau? And the answer, again, is everyone. Anyone who's involved in the election process, including all of you, of course, should contact the department, should contact the bureau um, if you're being intimidated, threatened, or harassed. So just as John has said multiple times that we want to hear everything, that this is sort of a broadly, a broadly all-encompassing effort by the department, that also is true in terms of people uh, with respect to their positions within the election infrastructure, within the election administration. Uh, that's all I have at the moment. So, kicking it back to John or Kirk, if you have anything to add. Sure. This is uh, Kirk Spielmaker with the FBI and the Public Corruption Unit. And um, I would just add, uh, first of all, uh, thank you to the group for uh, the invitation from the FBI here. Where it's, a, it's a privilege to participate. Um, and John and Sean have both done a good job describing the, the task force itself and, and the initiative in terms of um, getting word out as as widespread as we possibly can to get, <clears throat> excuse me, the 
um, response from uh, election administrators and the just kind of like the knowledge to be out there uh, widely that hey call please call the FBI please call the Department of Justice this is a, a, a top priority for us and I can assure you of that as I sit here um, at headquarters um, for the last several weeks and months um, this is a, a top priority within the Bureau um, so it, I won't kind of belabor that in terms of what John and Sean have already described what I would add is uh, just I, I previously was an election crimes coordinator in the field. I worked in the Cleveland, Ohio office for many years, and I, I held that position for um, many years. Um, that that position has um, taken on a, a lot of responsibility in the last four years, um, and is includes a, a full scale uh, election crimes working group that uh, encompasses cyber domestic terrorism, uh, terrorism, intelligence, counterintelligence, you name it. Um, in terms of the different sections within the um, the FBI, um, they all have agents and analysts that participate in that election crimes working group, and have been participating, you know, on some level um, as it pertains to this task force in terms of um, the training and the kind of the rollout to the field. Um, all of those folks have been um, filled in and educated to this uh, process. Um, those election crime working groups, the election crime coordinators in all 56 field offices have well-established relationships within um, the state um, election officials, this, for the most part, the uh, Secretary of State's office, but for um, purposes on this group as well, you know, state election directors. Um, we have created almost like a secondary uh, working group with all the different state functions to include um, the county boards of election employees and all the way down to the sheriff's office. Um, so as as previously described, um, you know, there there are ways in the event, even if it is some type of, um, you know, a day of where a, a polling location is open that Sean had referenced. Um, and, and maybe the FBI wouldn't be responding, you know, with lights and sirens to a polling place. But nonetheless, we have established we have established these relationships with state state and local officials who are absolutely our partners are aware of kind of what this process is, and we can certainly coordinate with those types of partners to make sure that um, all of these types of threats are being responded to, that they're being reported appropriately um, to to the federal resources here at the FBI and DOJ, and that those would be evaluated um, most certainly. Um, to to ter determine, you know, what types of steps we can take to kind of um, build a case and, um, you know, pass it along for prosecution. So um, I just wanted to just kind of touch on what kind of happens at the field office level, because I have a lot of experience in that and um, that this is a well established kind of working group that's taking place and that that particular role of election crime coordinator um, tends to be uh, an agent from the public corruption squad with a lot of experience. Um, so feel comfortable in um, communicating to your state partners, your county boards, uh, you know, your um, your staff within the state um, that please report this stuff and um, the FBI will respond and it will be um, evaluated obviously on, on a factual basis. But certainly, we want to we want to hear with you, from you and and um, be a good partner to you guys all. Thank you. Um, I know we have a few questions. Um, I will go um, first to um, Mark Waloshin from Nevada. All right. Thanks, Amy. Uh, can you hear me all right? Cool. Right on. Um, so, first of all, uh, my name is Mark Velosh, and I'm out here as the Deputy Secretary of State for Elections in Nevada. Um, I appreciate everything you guys have done, and certainly the, the most recent efforts, uh, you know, really across the, the federal partners. Um, I, I think it's going to be helpful in the long term. Um, one thing that I'm noticing here, and we got something that I reported to my own ECC about 15 minutes ago. So it's it's again, unfortunately, not a, a kind of a, a slow trickle. It seems to be a, a kind of a steady flow over the last. Nine or 10 months, and we anticipated only ramping up going forward. But, um, you know, while, while we address individuals that are making these bad decisions and, and making these statements towards election officials across the country, um, 
is there any any discussion about maybe increasing the the volume in which you identify what happens after they're prosecuted? And, and let me back up. I, I know, right? Like the wheels of justice turn slowly. Like we we just recently out here in Nevada, you know, uh, finally sentenced um, an individual for elections fraud um, from the 2016 election, right? So I've told everybody, I'm like, hey. You just wait, July of 2025, man, like clear your schedules. The 2020 folks are really going to get it then. Um, but we kind of, you know, a little bit just there, but recognizing that, you know, folks, I think are going to keep doing this and keep sending, you know, letters and documents and phone calls and emails. And you know, they're going to be empowered to keep doing that because they're not hearing about anyone getting prosecuted. They're not hearing anybody get in trouble at all um, for, for doing these sorts of similar actions to our counterparts across the country. Um, and I think that sort of messaging, again, whenever it does happen, right, at the appropriate time, you know, given, given what happens, um, might be useful and hope, hopefully kind of reducing the flow of these, these uh, you know, verbal assaults and threats and that sort of thing. Um, has there been any thought or, or discussion put into that, though? So, one way in which we, we try to publicize our efforts in this space and, and really generally in the election crime space or the public corruption space is just through uh, press releases, sometimes press conferences, um, media engagement, and, and we hope that that provides some degree of public messaging and some degree of deterrence. Um, so that's, you know, that that's one kind of consistent, uh, consistent approach that we take, you know, in, in most criminal cases in this space. I think um, beyond that, we're hopeful that more individual contact with the FBI and our state and local counterparts as part of this task force, even in cases that we're never able to charge, we're hoping that as more and more people start hearing, you know, from the FBI fairly quickly after they engage in this kind of activity, that that will also have a deterrent effect and that those contacts will start to be um, spread around more organically. Um, and, you know, look, sometimes it's going to be unhelpful because people will. People will make themselves out to be the victims of, you know, uh, an overly aggressive federal government that's trying to, you know, uh, infringe on their 1st amendment rights to engage in political speech. But even that, um, even those kinds of responses will hopefully increase public awareness of the fact that, hey, FBI and DOJ are paying attention. On a, on a state and local level uh, to threats to election officials. So, you know, those are the 2 primary methods. Um, uh, beyond that, at least for us at PIN and, and FBI too, because we're. We operate solely in the, in the criminal space. Um, there's not a whole lot of additional public messaging we can do. Although I know that there has been discussions. And Kirk, you, you know, jump, jump in and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think there have been discussions with state and local counterparts about doing, you know, a little bit more public education. I, I know DOJ has been releasing tweets uh, highlighting this issue and ways to report the issue. So, um, hopefully both at the national level and the state and local level level, you know, all three of those kinds of means will start to spread the word that. Uh, that this kind of conduct is taken very seriously at the highest levels of the government and, um, and maybe that will have, you know, some deterrent, some deterrent effect. No, no, I understand. And, and that's, it's very similar, honestly, to the approach that we're taking in regards to, uh, you know, our voter education campaigns. Um, out here in Nevada, we've got 1.83 million active registered voters, which again, peanuts probably in comparison to some other states. Uh, but we've realized that, you know, if, if I speak to folks in, in groups of, you know, 300 plus at a time, and it's, it's going to have less impact than if I am saying the exact same message to a group of maybe five or 10 people at a time. Um, and, and while, you know, setting up my calendar to talk to five or 10 people at a time to eventually get to all 1.83 million might take a few minutes. Um, it's certainly going to seem, it, it seemed to be more uh, persuasive and, and certainly more impactful. So I, I understand your approach and um, I, I agree. I, I'm hopeful that it, it's going to help deter stuff going forward. So. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your time. I, I would add quickly, if, um, this is Kirk Spielmaker from the FBI. And um, as John referenced, um, yes, we would, what we would do otherwise, what we would otherwise term as a knock and talk, we would, we do go out and, you know, 
get one or two, you know, tough looking FBI agents knocking on their front door and saying, you know, hey, I saw the Facebook message you put out there, or, you know, did you send, did you set, put this tweet out on social media, whatever the case may be. Although, although that's, that is not that threat, so to, that threat is not likely to be prosecuted. We're aware that we're not likely to hit the elements of this, of this federal statute. We are trying to be a little bit more proactive in terms of getting in front of people because we do believe there is a little bit of a deterrent. I've seen that in other circumstances in other types of violations. Um, so we're going to do a little bit more of that um, understanding, you know, every state is going to um, respond differently and, and address this type of situation differently to your point um, in Nevada. And I know in Ohio um, and other states, there were sometimes we would put, we, we would have uh, a video or a tweet or a Facebook message that ref from like the official, um, you know, a, a state election official basically like almost like a copy and paste of um, of like the, you know, I vote, hey, of the Facebook message that says, you know, hey, ha, 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 I voted two times in the, in the 20 election, um, 2020 election. And th there would be some kind of like reposting of that. And, and the official, the state official would kind of like make some reference to like, this is, this could is a potential, you know, state violation here, or this is a potential violation over, with this statute kind of thing that may, you know, th it, that's to be determined, you know, how, how much of a determinant that is, but that, and, and who wants to do that from one state to the next. Um, but we saw some of that taking place. I thought that was kind of clever that what we were seeing, it was almost kind of like, um, a cutesy way of kind of doing some of that for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, and then more um, broadly as this task force, from what I'm gathering, as this task force kind of rolls out further, obviously we're in the early stages here, um, and this is going to continue. I think it's I think it's safe to say this is going to go on through the next couple of election cycles. Um, that I th I think we are going to try try to make efforts to more um, nationally respond to some of this, so that if there is some reporting in the state of Nevada, for example, of a, of some type of uptick in you know. Uh, you know, threatening types of social media um, messaging or whatever the case may be, robocalls that are threatening of some sort, um, that we would report that more nationally in some type of intelligence targeting package that we sent out, send out so that, you know, the boards, the county boards and the state election officials in New York see what's going on in Nevada so that it, nationally it's kind of um, described so that everyone's kind of, Okay, I need to be aware of this. I need to be. I need to be paying attention to this kind of thing. No, no I understand. Yeah. That sounds great. Uh, I really appreciate that as well. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, I want to go next uh, to Megan Wolf from Wisconsin. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate you being here and appreciate you starting this engagement. I do have uh, two questions, and they're related to more how the task force is structured and sort of what we can expect. Um, the first being, could you speak to what sort of groundwork was done to understand the threats against election officials and uh, what types of threats it is that we're, we're facing both at the state and the local level? And then based on that groundwork, um, is there willingness to engage more in understanding it and uh, to possibly adjusting your solution if we find that the problem actually warrants a different solution uh, than the one that's in the works right now. And uh, next is you gave some examples of things that you can't prosecute, maybe threats that are too vague and things like that. And I think as election officials, that's often what we see is these sort of vague threats. Um, what efforts are underway to detect and analyze these more vague threats that may be directed at election officials and to help us understand if they amount to something that is a larger um, potential danger to us. And then who would be notifying us um, as part of this task force of a potential threatening activity that we might not be aware of as election officials? Thank you. So on the first question, uh, the groundwork that was done was essentially pretty informal. It was uh, canvassing and um, increased awareness as as media reporting increased about threats to election to election officials. 
also, you know, there were a handful of matters that were opened federally and investigated federally during the 2020 election cycle, but it was clear uh, to both FBI and, and DOJ from a headquarters and national perspective that the, the amount of matters that were that we were even aware of was uh, far fewer than the amount that were being reported in the public sphere. And so, uh, you know, with, with the increase in, uh, in reports of threats, I think it became apparent fairly quickly that we should, uh, that we should stand up something that's more coordinated and uh, that's, that uh, has a little bit more visibility at a, at a national level. You know, we've met with, um, with Amy and uh, we've met with Leslie, the executive director of the National Association of Secretaries of State, to try and get a little bit better of an idea of what you guys are facing and, and what your perspectives are. I think we've also talked about, we, we have done some training for all of our election crime coordinators nationwide and uh, district election officers, which are the federal prosecutors responsible for these kinds of cases uh, in each district. I think we, we've thought about um, perhaps having uh, somebody from your organization, uh, somebody from NAS uh, address that group as well. So that we can we can have a, an, a better understanding of the kinds of things that you're seeing and get your perspective. So, in terms of flexibility, if if criminal investigation and prosecution uh, doesn't seem to be having much impact, uh, the task force will make recommendations to the attorney general to see if there are other other ways in which um, deterrence you know might be able to be achieved. The the uh, civil rights. Division, both the voting section of the civil rights division is involved, and um, if there if there appeared to be some kind of civil remedies that would be you know more helpful here, some kind of injunctive relief or uh, or something along those lines, you know we would we would explore that. So there's absolutely flexibility in terms of trying to come up with the best response, but this is this is where we're starting. Uh, and then your second. Your second question about kind of differentiating between types of threats and um, what, you know, what information will be shared with you and who will be sharing it with you. Um, so right now, again, we want we want reporting of even the vague even the vague threats that that I've described as probably not federally actionable. We still want it reported right now so that we get. The exact kind of perspective that I think you're raising so that we have a better idea of the volume of those threats. And if there are certain locations nationally, there are hot spots for those kinds of well, for back, lack of a better word threats, even if they're not technically threats for, for criminal federal law purposes. So, so we're hoping that through through this task force and through this kind of engagement, we will get a better idea, a better sense of those. Those communications that are harassing or intimidating or critical, even if they're not, even if they're not meeting the, the federal threshold for, for criminal prosecution. Um, and then the election crime coordinators will reach out to you. I mean, we will assess those matters, even those that are not probably criminally actionable. We will still assess those. We will still reach out to you as the recipient of those kinds of communications and likely, as Kirk was describing, reach out to the people that are that are sending those communications. Um, but your point of contact should be your local election crime coordinator. That's who you're likely to hear from. And then I, I think I, Part of your question was also, well, what about, you know, who's going to share information with us that where maybe we weren't aware of it? Maybe it didn't come to us directly. And as part of what Kirk described, you know, I think hopefully even just by informing Amy, if we learn about a uh, certain activity that we think is noteworthy and would be would be uh, helpful to share with the with the entire group with all the members, we can share that with Amy. We can we can share that with other organizations like NAS, the state election boards. Um, uh, so, so there will be that kind of contact and then, and then in terms of individualized communications, you know, directed at a specific official, if, if it doesn't, appear, if it wasn't reported by the official, we're still intaking that and working that in the same way. And so, again, we would reach out to your local ECC election crime coordinator and say, hey, look, we've seen these kinds of Facebook posts targeting this individual or mentioning this individual. We're not sure that they're even aware of it. Can you reach out to them? Let them know that someone in Minnesota is posting, you know, these kinds of uh, messages, and see if they have any more information. Um, and so, and so, you should be hearing about those things through your election crime coordinator, even if they're not communicated to you directly by a member of the public. 
you. Um, we're running a bit short on time, but I'm going to go to Jared for one last short question and then um, to John and Sean and Kirk for one last short answer. Thanks, Amy. Appreciate it. Uh, first, I'm wondering if you can send Amy some marketing materials so that we can send those down to our county officials so that they can have something immediately in hand. So when these things do come in, they have a direct resource to be able to send that to you and, and contact and communicate those threats to you effectively. Um, the second question I had was more in line with what Megan was was talking about in her second question, but is, you know, in the past we've seen you know, FBI, DOJ, because of the investigative nature of your, your missions, you're kind of a black hole. And we'll pass something up that is a, a threat, whether that is a, a systems threat or something else. And anytime we ask for information back on it so that I can use that intel back to securing my system and utilizing that effectively, it's, well, it's an ongoing investigation and we don't make comments on that, even though it was an investigation about, you know, my system. So that it concerns me that, you know, we're going to fall into that same category with this. And, you know, one, one final thought on, on specific to that is if you do have, you know, so if we're passing up threats to you, some of them are incredibly vague. Some of them are more specific, but the ones that are vague. I have to treat just as seriously as the ones that are more specific because I've got to protect myself and my staff. So if there's some sort of feedback you can give back to us, it makes it more effective for us to, you know, protect ourselves. So, but in, in thought of that, I, is there going to be a response that helps provide resources to us for protection when these things do become real? Because I know, and I can't speak for all my colleagues, but like, many of them were impacted greatly during this last election cycle where those resources were not going to them appropriately or effectively. So quickly, uh, being cognizant of time, I mean, to your last point, that is something that is is um, a little bit outside of PIN's lane specifically in terms of working on congressional funding or um, some kind of grants from DOJ or, or DHS. Uh, but but it is something that we've discussed and something that um, we are we are working with the with the right offices at DOJ um, to try and see if that's something that we could propose to Congress or if it's something that we could uh, that we could you know take advantage of if, if there are already existing funds within DOJ or DHS. So it's it's something that yes we're we're aware of and thinking about in terms of trying to provide. Funding for more security resources for all of you and and um, and your your colleagues and your state and local partners, um, the election boards. So the so the earlier question. Uh, so please report the vague threats, just like the just like the specific threats. Again, we right now we want more visibility. We just want awareness, and um, I think there is value in us being able to, if we're able to figure out who the source of those communications are, contact them and, um, and investigate through, through interviewing them. I think there's value in that, deterrent value in that, you know, in and of itself. And so we want reporting of, of general and specific kind of communications. Um, you will receive follow up from an ECC. That's the way that this whole task force is set up. If you don't let Amy know, Amy will let me and Sean know, and we will ensure that you do receive follow up. I think here we are going to be, we are somewhat limited when there's an active criminal investigation, but you as the, as the victim or, or whoever is the victim are generally entitled to receive, uh, more information. And, um, and I think because of the nature of the task force and because of the nature of the fact that many of these communications are not necessarily going to be criminally actionable, we are going to be able to share more information with you and provide more feedback. So hopefully that improves over um, maybe what you've experienced in the past. Thank you. I would uh, add, this is Kirk from the FBI. I would add that um, the marketing material you had brought up uh, initially there, we do have an updated, um, I think like some type of trifold brochure uh, election crime uh, matter type of marketing material that I actually have seen as of the last um, seven days. So I think that is going to be something that you're going to be um, receiving in the near future from uh, from a, a FBI headquarters um, in terms of points of contact. Um, this is what's this is what a federal election crime is. This is you know this is this new task force and the new initiative as it pertains to the uh, to the election administrator threats, um, and then. 
um, to some of your later questions, the, um, you know, if, if you have been threatened or a staffer has been threatened and you actually are um, in, in a, a state of, you know, where you're concerned about your safety, we would, you know, the FBI would treat you just like um, any other witness and or victim in a criminal investigation. And we absolutely would work with our state and local law enforcement partners to ensure that, you know, your safety, that we're, maybe we work with, you know, a, a patrol being present um, in the area or, you know, an extra, extra, you know, security at the, at the county board that received the, the threat of some sort. We would absolutely work to do that. Um, so, you know, I don't want you to think that, you know, we're, we're just going to take the complaint, uh, look at it, make, come to some determination if, if, if we meet the elements of a federal offense and move on. Um, and, and you're not really kind of getting updates. If there is some type of ongoing safety issue, we'll, we'll most certainly work to uh, ensure that our witnesses and our victims are, are cared for. Thank you all. Yeah. Um, I, will, I will turn it back uh, to Michelle to uh, close out this session and move on to something more uplifting. Excellent, thanks Amy. Um, we, we appreciate your taking the time to talk to us, especially with the new task force. Um, we look forward to working with you, although we really wish we didn't have to, um, and that this wasn't such a real issue for so many of us. Um, having said that, we again want to thank you for, for coming and, um, and the information that you've provided. I'm sure many of us will be in touch with you by reporting information.